Thank you very much for the distressing but very important summary of all the situation. I just want to make one particular point because it gets overlooked very easily, and that is the importance of play. And with, I mean, you, it was mentioned, absolutely. But I just want to emphasize something about it because I, in my experience in many cases, that's overlooked. And it's sort of, well, we, I mean, and for good reasons. I mean, the, the, the health, the safety, et cetera, certainly take large roles. But play in the sense that it is a safe space for trying out roles. It's a space in which collaboration can occur across differences. It's a, um, it becomes a means of opening dialogues. And it provides also a framework that both allows escape from the realities, but allows also a sense of agency of the child feeling, I mean, if it's done appropriately, child learns the sense that they are able to control something, which for many of these children, not only them, they do not have, and they are not allowed in the normal school situation. So just, just to emphasize that, but thank you for the overall view of it. I know that most of you have never looked at the general comments of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, but I would love to encourage you to do so, because we've been working, I used to be a member of the committee for eight years, and during uh, also my uh, uh, presence there, we were preparing a general comment on, on the right to play, with the help of the International Play Association. And in many instances, the governments coming to the committee ha are really... I mean, annoyed when we are asking them how can they ensure, for instance, in the refugee camp or children in really um, risky situations, how can they provide them the access to play? Because I am in full agreement with you that this is the basic activity that should help children uh, to develop and, and, and grow. So there is no question about it. And also, I guess, uh, play could play a much bigger role in the education system compared to the formal learning. And we all know the importance of play, but it is underestimated because it's considered as childish, sadly. And this is also true when it comes to the play to the adults. We all should play, and probably our conflict resolution uh, patterns would change very dramatically if we could be much more playful and enjoy each other's company as it was just uh, told by you in the previous session. Thank you for reminding us. Yes, Dan? I, I spent 40 years doing evolutionary biology in Latin America, but the most important thing that ever happened to me was 1974 in Bogota seeing the street kids, the Aminas, and especially coming out early one morning and seeing a group of them get up and move away except for the two little ones who had died overnight. And you can't see something like that and, and, and be unchanged. So this is, this is critically important, thank you. Only a view from Austria, I think we have uh, for sure some immigration and also some situation on this subject. Uh, first of all, I think there's a very different situation between the children and also in general of integration in the urban area and the rural area. The urban area is a bigger problem, uh, but the number for sure are higher. <coughs> Second, I think uh, the experiences I'm got referred is the real problem is a second generation. The first generation is very much running to be integrated, to have some success, and uh, I think they have a background. Uh, the third generation has already mainly arrived. The second generation is still connected <coughs> with their traditional surrounding. Uh, also, the main problems are here concerning language and language learning here. 
Uh, I think the first point I uh, would be interested to, to hear from you something about this. And the second one is we have, by the Austrian situation, a huge differentiation from where they are coming. The real problems uh, in Austria are existing uh, by uh, grown-up for sure, but also children coming from Chechnya, from Pakistan and from Afghanistan. Because obviously there they were learning to fight uh, because it's a tradition there and they are still fighting even if they arrived in Austria. I think are there similar experiences or are there some research done on this? issue and as I've spent my last many decades in child protection and the institutionalization of children so I can say that this is one of the basic issues not only when it comes to children in migration situations but all children who are deprived for any reason how can you ensure that while you want to take into consideration the need for an identity a culture traditions you are also challenging the identity, the culture, and the tradition, if it's harmful. And this is a very, very, very delicate topic. And I guess Austria and all the developed countries are facing this problem, even those who've been really supportive and friendly with uh, uh, migrants uh, from all parts of the world, because they are um, in a conflict with their own values when it comes to the issue whether I respect your identity or culture and traditions that are harmful either for the child or, or both for the society and the environment. And we know that, for instance, female genital mutilation, which is one of the big issues now. Just recently, two days ago, one of the American judges were in an interesting way, making a statement on it. I understand his reason for that, and I don't like it. And I must say, yeah, I mean, we know that, again, it's about men, it's not about women. And uh, I don't want to use your time, but I remember we had a, a general comment also, together with the CEDAW committee in the UN, uh, talking about female genital mutilation. And the protest from men, when we tried to incorporate also circumcision into this uh, general comment, was vast. We couldn't. There was no way, because it was considered as a totally different thing. And now we get it back based on this decision of the American charge. So it's extremely interesting. But coming back to the point, it's just a kind of uh, sign of how many complicated consequences there are if you want to touch uh, the question of in, uh, uh, inclusion and integration. So what are you doing with the language? I fully agree with you. O moreover, I also have a lot of uh, issues when it comes to intercountry adoption, for instance. Children adopted by wonderful people in a country different from the origin of the child, teach the child the local language. These kids lose all their, all their roots. They, lose the language, they lose the culture, they lose their identity because it is considered by those who are making the decisions about them that this is providing them a better chance in their life. So these are very delicate issues and I don't see that there is enough discussion about the impact and, in, uh, and the long-term uh, impact of these decisions made locally. When it comes to the integration and inclusion also, when it comes to Austria, and, uh, as you mentioned, but also in Germany, what you can see, that even in Sweden, Holland, when we are now f uh, confronted with the fact that second, third generation children are not speaking the language properly or they are not motivated to be integrated, the question is, have we done enough to analyze the policies or the lack of proper policies in place? This is the same in the US with uh, the Hispanic uh, population, have we done enough to uh, understand what is needed to be done so that we can help these children keeping their identity, keeping their language, but at the same time be integrated into the uh, new environment? And actually, based on the brain research, we also know that for instance, bilingual children having a lot of advantages compared to those who are losing the the uh, mother tongue. So there are many, many issues here that don't seem to be strategically so important than the big, the big questions. This seems to be a kind of secondary or tertiary issue 
Although, obviously, according to my understanding, if we are not challenging the way we are approaching childhood and uh, the upbringing of children, we can lose everything. Because this is the first step, and we have to build on that all the other strategies. And it doesn't seem to count. And I'm, I must say that perhaps because it's a womanish topic still, so it is hard to uh, reach the... Um, reach those decision makers and policy makers and politicians who should make proper decisions on these questions. Okay, so thank you all for your presentations from this morning. Uh, I want to direct my question to Maria Herzog and also to Erhard Busek. Because as this is the general topic we've been discussing this for the last three days. It's about migrations and as you know, Part of the Balkan route was closed for the migrations during the last years. However, as we know, this never closes. People still try to go on and so on and so forth. And this is the question of children as well. One of the new countries that was involved in this is my country. I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina right now. And we have an interesting situation in the northwest part of the country on the border with Croatia, where basically migrants are constantly trying to move and cross the borders. Croatian police seems to be beating them up quite a bit. I'm not fully certain on this because I'm not on the field. But uh, from what, I, what I'm really interested in, into is because you both are, you're a former politician and you're practicing this. I want to know what is the current situation on the political level? Is there some kind of a plan, not only in this certain situation, because as Dan Brooks already mentioned yesterday and others, this will not stop. So basically, is there any kind of plan, any kind of idea what to do about this? Because the problem will not go away, especially when we consider that this country where they right now, Bosnia and Herzegovina, they don't want to stay in this country. People who live in this country don't want to stay in it, and the country itself being the weak state or some kind of superficial state cannot provide for them in any kind of way, and many children are, of course, in danger. So I would just like to hear your opinions on the realities. Let's not theoretically uh, talk about these big issues of identity and so on, but is there a plan to actually do something about this, or basically we are just waiting for this ad hoc situation and waiting for the best, that somehow this crisis will stop, which probably will not happen. So thank you. Oh, that's a good question. I think interesting question, difficult to answer. I think uh, officially you won't find any European government saying I'm in favor uh, of migration and uh, I'm inviting you to come. I think the example of Angela Merkel and the consequences uh, which has happened to her and to Germany and so on and so on, a very bad example. Huh? So far I think uh, the problems are really horrible. Horrible in the sense that uh, the tendency to be against this United Nations paper uh, on uh, migration and, and integration uh, is increasing uh, and it is a little bit contrary to what's happening in reality. Uh, for Austria, having a government which is uh, uh, center-right, plus-right uh, composition, officially I think uh, they are not in favor of having a real integration policy, but uh, interesting enough, uh, the Chancellor Kurz recently made a statement, we are an immigration country because we need it by the development of the population. So you have a very mixed situation. So far we are getting some immigrants. Uh, and something is done on the subject, but nothing is officially and very typical uh, for Austria. It's done in, I'm using the expression of the, uh, the Austrian language, schlampig. I think it is uh, in between, muddling through uh, and so on and so on. Uh, there's something happening. I'm really fed up about the closed Balkan route uh, because this is expressed uh, since years. The Balkan route is not anymore existing. You are totally right concerning Croatia. But the allow me one remark. There should be a pressure on behalf of the European Union and of the United States to change the situation in Bosnia. I think uh, even if we are allowing that everybody from Bosnia can come, it's not solving the problem of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And I think this is a real mistake uh, by the uh, European Union and by the United States uh, not uh, to have put pressure for changes in, in Bosnia itself. 
because we, we lose all the population. I think the universities and, and the uh, concerning trained people in, in business, it's empty. And that's not the solution for Bosnia itself uh, so far. I think we have to separate the questions. For sure, there are some obligations and so on and so on. <coughs> but the strategy, everything should be solved uh, by uh, migration and integration. That's not the only way of solution. As far as I see, this is a symptom and not a, not the, not the root of the problem. So the the. Migration is the symptom of the crisis we are living in. And I guess if we are not resolving the basic issues, then we obviously cannot deal with the symptoms. So this, this is where we are in a trap. At the same time, we have to be confronted with the, with the suffering, the human suffering and loss we are experiencing here. So I guess this, this, is, this, is the, this makes it so extremely complicated and, and very, very painful, because you cannot handle it at the level of immigration when it comes to the root causes. And what can we do? I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm not competent in answering that. I'm just full of fear and, uh, and, and, and real pain, because I, I don't feel that I can do what I feel I should do, because there, there are no tools to resolve that. Okay, um, hello, um, thank you for your presentation. And my question will target a specific group of um, children, uh, unaccompanied minors. Uh, we know the UN um, Declaration on Rights of the Child that you talked about um, define a child as somebody below the age of 18. Now, let's say in the case of unaccomp unaccompanied minors and um, they don't have birth certificates, are there any mechanisms to determine their ages? Because you may find cases where somebody looks. Okay. Can you say how it will be It's very easy possible scientifically to determine the age of a person. It's not, not a difficult issue. I guess uh, th this is a very complex issue because, on the one hand, we understand that many young adults wouldn't bring their birth certificate even if they had because they are hoping that there is a, a kind of different procedure for under the age of 18 kids who are <coughs> uh, have who in principle should have more entitlements than the adults oftentimes they experience that this is not the case as i was showing the number it is really shocking to see that over 100 countries in the in uh, all over the world are detaining actually children regardless of their age even very young ones, as we could see now recently uh, in the States, for instance, but, but also in, in many other countries you can see that. The other question is obviously um, how can you help these people who are arriving regardless of their age? Uh, there are many attempts in Europe currently, for instance, to place into foster care instead of institutions and detention young persons. But obviously, with teenagers with very traumatic past, it is often very hard for them to be uh, uh, integrated into a family, into, into a totally new culture, an unknown language, totally different school system, and so on. So we have been uh, debating a lot in the international community how could we the best serve the interests of these young people regardless of their age because for me it doesn't really make difference if they are 16, 18 or 20 because from the, from the perspective of the solution or the service provision it doesn't make much uh, difference especially because the, the very traumatized young persons need help and regardless of their age, they are not ready for an independent life, even if they seem to be adults. So the question is rather what kind of services are there as far as health, mental health, social service provisions are concerned, and whether we could provide the proper services for them to heal, to recover, and then doing whatever they can. Um, on the other hand, I also understand that many politicians are suspicious and they are doing all these bond density and other quite humiliating um, examinations to determine the, the age of the child regardless of their needs. And obviously this is also not uh, very helpful, but this is, again, 
coming back to your question, it's a political decision. It has nothing to do with the best interests of children or adults. It's just um, something that is serving the local population or the voters, if you like, sadly, because there is a very strong opposition to accept that the, whoever is arriving is in need of help besides those very few ones who are making problem locally. Is there an idealization of the family as the principal mechanism to shelter, in the broader sense of the term, children? Because um, I, I wonder, I myself would not have wanted to be integrated into certain families, and sometimes my own. Uh, and I, I think to myself, you know, do we, do, do we, or do you as a part of a community, do you have standards, I mean, in the deepest sense, not just in physical terms, but the deepest sense, how families should be? Because to be integrated into some families, it seems to me, would be horrific for some children. Um, I have a friend who was adopted, didn't bond with her adoptive parents, and, and when she went to, <laughs> to, she went searching for her biological parents, and actually moved to where they were with her small child, and after a year said, I really can't live with fundamentalist Christians. How do you make, how do you make those choices? Well, again, we could spend the rest of the weekend or the next week discussing it, and I'm, I would be happy. I can talk 24 hours about this, so be very careful because I can't stop talking about it. No, basically what I think, you are absolutely right. They are poisonous families. They are very harmful families. What we are focusing on from a child rights perspective is primarily listening to the children. And this is always, or almost always missing. It is clear that if you are listening to the children and you are taking their views into consideration, that would not only have a very long lasting effect on democracy and on society, but also in the individual's child life. Because children know in most of the situations what they need. However, it's our responsibility as adults to make the decision. So that we shouldn't push back the decision on them, the responsibility. It's our responsibility to measure whether their wishes and their views are accurate to their age, to their situation, and make a fair decision and not blaming them for that decision. On the other hand, what we are talking about when it comes to family, that in most of the instances, not all the instances, most of the families have got resources that are extremely important for children, even very troubled families. So the, the first thing is, how could we support the families to recognize their extremely important role in the life of the children and nurture them properly to the extent they can? And obviously providing all the needed support to the families to be able to fulfill their obligations in the upbringing of their children. Because if you look at the research evidence on long longitudinal follow-up research on children leaving the care system, adoption, uh, and other um, um, research, I mean, we've got really good samples, not enough. It shows that with the best solutions ever, children are always feeling that there is a missing part in their life. So they are missing this acceptance and respect what they should have got from their own parents and families. And when we are talking about families, it's not only the parent. It might be the aunt, a godmother, a, um, a sibling, even a neighbor. That's why we are talking about kin and not just family per se. Because oftentimes what we see is that if there, oh no, it's not, it's, there is evidence in the resilience research actually, that you need one person you can trust and who respects you. And then you are saved and protected. Now what we are trying to do in child protection is obviously A, strengthening the community and the family so that they can keep the child within the, their circles because that can ensure a kind of stability, but also uh, helping them recognizing the need for emotional nurturing. And what 
what is the shocking fact of the last 20 years brain research, actually. If you look at the brain research of Harvard, Shonkoff and um, others, you can see that with MRI and other um, uh, technical opportunities today, we can prove what Bowlby and others have said, all the psychologists for decades, that the most important element of the upbringing of the children is the uh, acceptance of the child and emotional nurturing. So even the least educated parents, the most troubled parents, if they can hug their child, if they keep them in their arms, if they can respond to the needs of the child, feeding them when they are hungry and not when I am hungry, as the joke says that most children are, um, um, they, the, the uh, children are, have to put on jumpers when the mother is freezing. So that, that's roughly the thing. What, <laughs> it's more complicated than that, of course. So what we are trying to say, that even in, in the most troubled families, there are some resources, and we should build on that, and also helping the children relating to it, and in other cases, obviously, protecting the children from those poisonous uh, uh, influences that can be devastating from their perspective. And another thing is that, obviously, when we are talking about family, there are alternative families. So if we are, we can have to place or separate the child from the biological family, still we should have, and again, if you look at the United States, where 500,000 children are roughly in foster care, and most of them are not very well, it's because the system is not providing the needed support, assessment, training, uh, in-service training and services to the foster carers to be good enough parents um, compared to any other non-familiar situation, uh, we still think that the individual attention and bonding, what is the most important element of our survival, is uh, uh, provided within the family if it is an okay family. It hasn't, has to be perfect. None of us are perfect. So it's very complex, and I would be more than happy if we could have the next year's Blue Sky Conference on this topic. I just suggest it for you. Uh, there's nothing by any stretch of the imagination that one wouldn't agree with uh, in respect of both your point of departure and the degree of commitment and passion that you bring to it. So. Uh, number one, congratulations in terms of the amount of time, effort, and sweat and blood and God knows what else that you've devoted to it over the years. Now you've got to turn the question round. You want an outcome. And in wanting an outcome, one now has to deal with the audience to whom one is addressing this. And as always, there are multiple audiences. There is public opinion, there is the media community. But at the end of the day, whether it's the adoption of a convention or whether it's the execution of a policy within a national border, it's a group of policy makers charged with particular responsibilities whose minds, frankly, are easily overwhelmed by the scale and the scope of what we're talking about. <clears throat> and then that requires us to think about how to approach <clears throat> definitionally the problem. So, this is children in migration, and it's a perfectly valid frame, it's an excellent frame for thinking about several dimensions of it. But think about the rest of the challenge that we're dealing with on policy levels. We're dealing with this concept of migrants. We're dealing with a subset called forced migrants. We're dealing with refugees, we're dealing with asylum seekers. And then we've got certain transversal elements across all of those. Persons who are fleeing objective persecution, wars, um, circumstances where ethnic cleansing is being undertaken. And then we're dealing with the other transversal sets of trafficking and people smuggling. Uh, and then we're dealing with the challenges of integration into societies. And all of these operate at different levels of scale. And then, in Europe at least, you get another problem at the interface with security because of fears, some justified and some completely exaggerated, about infiltration by radical groups of people into refugee trains in this particular regard. Now, the only reason I'm saying all that is not to confuse it. It's simply to say that when one's trying to get policy out of all of this, 
one's got to slice and dice it, crudely put, into pieces that are capable of being processed through policy instruments. And then, as Eckhart Wussek uh, said very correctly, you've got the fundamental problem, as you added, if you don't solve the source, then you can't address the means adequately because the scale becomes too large in respect of it. You've spent a whole lot of time living within the UN system in a certain sense, dealing with these particular challenges. What have you learned about how best to dice and slice it? Because I don't know the answers and I live on the margins of quite a lot of these debates. Well, obviously, as um, I have never been an UN employee, I was just a civil, I mean, an expert serving on the Committee on the Rights of the Child, I have been bumping into the same problems what Professor Bozak was also mentioning when it comes to the um, capacities of the UN to be very polite. Uh, and it always reminded me, I shouldn't say that, to the Soviet Union. So it's a very bureaucratic, huge, slow boat turning around in a very specific way and obviously challenged by many other political considerations and even a lot of secret agenda. So obviously children's issues are the least important among all that, if you look at the system itself. And even the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, sadly, is not legally binding. Although 194 countries ratify the convention, and although you, the US has always been accused for not ratifying, but the world is not aware of the fact that the UN actually signed the convention and ratified the two optional protocols, meaning that in principle, that's what I'm always telling to my American colleagues when they are complaining about the lack of ratification, you can actually implement it. Why wouldn't you implement it? There's no, no any kind of objection to implement it properly because the articles are there, you can follow the uh, rule of law or even the ideas of implementing. But within the UN system, when it comes to children, I haven't seen that we are powerful enough to influence politics. Actually, on the contrary, it has been challenged in, in all possible ways when it comes to the more important issues. And obviously there are a lot of uh, political constraints currently because of the fundamentalist ideas spreading the UN and also the Council of Europe when it comes, for instance, to the family. And this is a very controversial thing, not only from the perspective of whether the, the families are good or not, but also if you look at the Christian fundamentalists, Muslim fundamentalists and other groups who try to influence currently, for instance, the Human Rights Council, on making resolutions on the rights of the families to their privacy, meaning that we shouldn't intervene in, even in cases of severe abuse and violation of the rights of the child, because look at the homeschooling movement and many of its impact. Again, I don't see that most of the people are realizing how essential and basic these issues are influencing the bigger picture and the decisions on many other things. Rather, it seems to be like a secondary or tertiary importance compared to the real stuff. So within the UN, I, I mean, as an expert, we were sitting in, the, in a committee on the rights of the child and making recommendations for all the countries coming to the committee. Interestingly, there um, uh, was an analysis made on the impact of the concluding observations of the different treaty bodies. And what is fascinating for me, that the UPR recommendations, the UPR is the Universal Periodic Report Committee, for those who are not aware of this jargon, it's awful, I know. This, this is the reporting procedure where the countries are evaluating each other, not independent experts in the treaty body system. And for the, for the governments, this is much more relevant and important than the independent experts' opinion on their state of art. So this is in itself giving you a kind of insight what is important and what counts compared to what should count and what should be really uh, relevant for, for the governments to understand and hear. Because obviously we are not challenged in most of the committees, have never been challenged by political considerations. It's quite a neutral, very colorful group of people coming from 
all parts of the world. So there is no reason. And for instance, in the Committee on the Rights of the Child, we had a very strict policy on consensus when it comes to concluding observations, making a lot of good and a lot of harm, of course, because we couldn't make any, any decision or any um, um, a suggestion without a consensus among the 18 people coming from 18 different parts of the world. I don't know whether I could answer your question. No, no, but there is no answer. My name is Laszlo Jobaj. I'm from Metropolitan University in Budapest, and uh, I'd like to make a comment not only on your presentation, but to, on general discussion that we had today. Um, I think the main uh, issue is what Sean has raised before, which is, are we capable of uh, coming up with norms and institutions before chaos and catastrophe will hit us. I think that's the, all of us here who are scientists probably know what the situation in the world, so it means that intellectuals are aware of the situation. And we also understand that uh, the main institution that you just described, United Nations, is not functioning. It's not an institution that can uh, significantly influence the future. Now, what could be our hope? Our could, one hope would be if we, if we would have visionary politicians. But instead of visionary politicians, we have extremely ignorant politicians that uh, I don't want to list their names, but mo every one of us could list uh, quite a number of them. Another alternative would be, let's say, an international or global movement to address global issues, because all these issues that we are talking about, whether migration that, can, that is a consequence of climate change, local war, growing inequality. These are the main issues that has to be addressed. None of them can be addressed on the local level. They all should be addressed on a global level. So, I mean, I mean scientists, social scientists, natural scientists, all of us are aware of this. If we are not aware of this, we can lead, you know, what Harari says in his uh, latest book, that uh, humanity faces three challenges. Nuclear war, which we also talked about today, uh, climate change, and uh, technological disruption, which is a cyber war. None of this can be addressed on a local level. Now, um, I give you one positive example. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, when the cars appeared in the cities, you know, there were a lot of accidents because the cars, even though they were driving only 25 kilometers per hour, they were very dangerous and created a lot of accidents. And uh, what we did only one very simple thing. We invented the traffic sign, you know, the stop sign. And this very simple rule basically allowed us today to have millions of cars, not completely out, you know, uh, not completely eliminating accidents, but reducing them to a manageable level. So that's, what, that's why we would need norms that Sean has already mentioned. But uh, what is, you know, also have been said uh, during these days that unfortunately it seems that humanity is capable of creating this type of norms only after catastrophe. And so I guess we have only one alternative because we, don't, we can't trust the visionary politicians to appear. Uh, I think we have to just create movements to try to c compel our politicians to behave differently. And how we can do that, I have to say, is technology. Because, you know, technology we see as a threat at the moment. But technology can be used uh, to... Uh, China just implemented 200 million cameras and implemented a social score system for you know, for the citizens of China, which is, uh, you know, uh, 1984 or a terrible world that you can see. But the same technology that can observe citizens can also observe politicians. So I think what we should demand, honestly, honestly, what, what, I, what I think we should demand that every politician should be observed 24 hours a day by, by the society, because if, if this would happen, we wouldn't have to fear wars or whatever. 
beg your pardon uh, to comment on this. It's very nice, but without any chance. <laughs> I think I wish you all the best. As long as the nation state is a reality, and the nation state is choosing the politicians, you won't get uh, enough possibility to realize it. I think you have to look to the reality. It is a very nice intellectual debate which you are doing, it's far off reality. I'm based in reality and I'm coming from there. I'm, <laughs> beg your pardon, stop. Uh, I think intellectuals are always very wise at having comments. You are not arriving at those who are voting. I think this you have to consider. I think uh, you are totally right. The wrong politicians are elected, but they are elected. And they have majority. Look to this country, to this beloved country, and so on and so on. Yeah, wait a minute. I think that is typical intellectual. You know everything, but you are not arriving at the reality. And the reality is different. You have to go to the people uh, concerning understanding and to campaign in this direction that they are changing the elections of politicians. No, 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 not at all. Okay, I wish you all the best. <laughs> No, oh, I, I, uh, if I, if I may respond, you sound like a, you, you sound like a Marxist who knows what the future is holding for us. You know, can you, can you from, can you forecast? Quite clear, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, but uh, honestly, uh, I don't think. First of all, I think we are too old. That's number one. That's one of the problems. So we see, we are experienced. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I think. But, but unfortunately, the young people are not here. And I, I, I think our only hope, if they understand this situation, because, because if, they, if they will understand the situation, they will change the world. If they don't understand the situation, then you're right. The Gentlemen, reality will um, sink in. Um, I, beg you, I beg your pardon. I just Hello. wanted to say, uh, to, uh, towards the end, not as a schluss word, but I just wanted to kind of praise ourselves, yourself, how peaceful and um, agreeing and harmonious at the same time, at the same time, how informative and intellectually high level this discussion of yesterday, the day before yesterday, today was and still is. And it's not our merit, it's your merit. Thank you very, very much for the wonderful presentations and, and the intellectually very high level discussions and remarks after the presentations. And now comes my humble question and an even more humble suggestion. We have been discussing this with a few um, colleagues that I ask, um, especially Janos Bogardi and, 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 and some others who are not here anymore, how to continue, if there is a chance to conclude, and I, I sympathize with Jula's suggestion, I'm not sure either that we can immediately jump into a new global movement. On the other hand, there is a big need for it. And that should be discussed, and yes, we are intellectuals, but some of us, Maria, uh, <coughs> are already <laughs> allying with Jim and different things. She's a practitioner and an intellectual, and many of us are in a similar position. So we are influencing up to a certain degree our environment. Some of us are talking to politicians quite frankly. And, um, and uh, I don't think that this group here um, in the three days doesn't have any chance uh, to influence or change the world at least up to a certain degree. And that I, I express my concern a couple of times uh, during this conference, um, that, I would, that I would really, I wouldn't like to continue the same kind of exercise. The third Blue Sky Conference coming together, discussing more or less similar topics, sometimes a bit more philosophical, sometimes a little bit more of, about culture and history. Today, uh, yesterday, more about real realities and dangers, and actually it was wonderful how how naturally these issues um, fit, almost like, like chapters of a book. Why? Because you are all, all the time thinking about these complexities and 
and those who work at IASC, they, they have a, a, a common mission, a common intellectual denominator to try to establish at least intellectually, and then we'll see how far we can go with the practice, intellectually establishing links and understanding of interdependencies and complexities, which is not an easy issue. It's rather a big challenge. But I think we have learned, I have been learning permanently from you, and I think we have learned a lot. We have the chance to, to listen, um, to, to watch ourselves. We have the videos, tapes, or, or, or the YouTube, and, and I ask uh, website, everything is available. My, again, my humble question to you is, is how to proceed. So what do you think should be the next step? We already, with Bella, um, and, and my colleagues started to talk about the next year blue sky topic, and my thought was not very original, but quite timely to talk more in detail about Europe's future. We have a we have a, an, a European parliamentary elections ahead, and um, in one thing every politician agrees that it, this is going to be a different um, European set of systems after 2019 May. Now, what brings me to the point that there was a movement, as Erhard knows probably better than I do, um, which is a long movement, uh, a pro-European, pan-European movement from the beginning of the 20s, Kudenhof, Kalergi, Aristide Bion, and I don't give you the whole list of names of the 20th century history, and then came the conviction uh, over, over the political party split during the Second World War, that things have to be changed. And that was remarkable. For even today, I'm, when I'm teaching it, I'm always surprised how communists, anarchists like Spinelli, uh, conservatives um, like Adenauer, and many, many uh, different people from all of the political angles agreed that this should not happen anymore. And that was a peace project. And I'm sorry, we forget it very often. This was from below. There was no UN, no global system, no money to support this movement or nothing. The people understood that it, this should not happen anymore. And now what is what we face today? That, that we see this, even this fundamental, the fundamentum of, of the European integration. It was not money and not institutions and not a neoliberal big market called the single market. It was this peace project. It is endangered. And so this is why um, it's in serious danger. It's evaporating, it's crumbling, and, and it has a global importance, not because Europe is so much better than any other parts of the world, or so much more influential or whatever. Um, I'm very, very much against a, any Eurocentric thinking. <clears throat> uh, but because there was an attempt, thanks to this understanding, to create institutions which would allow national societies uh, to transpass their narrow-minded, egotistic, um, and self-undermining so-called so national identities and interests. It's not, again, that I'm against the nation state, or against national identities, we have to understand that they prevail, they are very important and should not be neglected. And I even agree with those who say, national politicians, that only strong nation states can unite. If you don't have a stronger community, politically, socially, I say, it's, you are simply acting under certain constraints or, or you are just submerging in anarchy. All this said, where is the supranational, transnational dimension and component today? Now, this, especially the discussion today, Kister clearly showed that it is more endangered and disintegrated than we actually think and talk about it on, a, in, on an everyday basis. And as, again, I'm coming back to an important, I think important issue, as the mainstream media suggests, when you read Der Spiegel or, or the New York Times, you have the feeling that there is a strong, liberal, politically correct uh, order, yeah? There are people, politicians, uh, bankers, financial gurus, who, 
who can save and guarantee this order. And I'm sure this is absolutely not the case. They are in position, and there are many who are listening to them. But you know what Zilionka told us? It was a very interesting um, Skype long lecture and interview with him. He himself is a liberal. Started self-reflection. A first time, I, I, I finally I hear it from someone very well established in the middle of the Western academic world, Oxford University, that something very wrong on that side. No solutions are going to come from these institutions, which are themselves very weak already, competing for more money and prestige still, playing the old 20th century games in a situation where we are not just undermining our future in general terms, preparing for cyber wars, but the concrete way how Maria explained this to us, we are more senior researchers and intellectuals are talking in general in terms of, oh, we are not, it's not, not about us, we are not going to be here very long anymore, it's, 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 it's the future, yeah. but the future is the children which the system produces, yeah? and who, can you imagine their reactions to, to the years coming? And um, these are the, you know, this is the reserve army of those who are creating much more dangerous cyber wars. Because they are uprooted, they don't have a future, they're full of suppressed anger and, and, and aggress aggression, etc. And they are neglected. So the big problem is here with our political system is the abandoned. Within the boundaries of the nation state, half of the population was forgotten. In the United States, the result is Trump. In the United, this United Kingdom today, the, the, the result is Brexit and we still don't see. And in, in almost all countries, what we call politically correct liberal democracy, this was anti-democratic. I agree with the criticism of illiberalism, but, but the, the biggest, strongest illiberal set of, of events were triggered and actualized by the United States with these wars. Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and Syria, etc. Which the, 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 the most of the Western world was just pushed in, never really discussed. That was the last 20 years. And then you can, it's, it's good reasons. You can criticize everything, Hungary, for, for good reasons. But Hungary bashing is it's actually just uh, 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 diverting attention to this more imp for, from these more important global contradictions, paradoxes, and dangers. Now, so I think it's time probably to speak out, as you did, and I'm, I'm really very thankful, and, be, and, and remain civilized. I was very glad that there was no, not even, you know, um, verbal aggression in this, in this, in this room for three days. Um, and not that people ag agreed with, with everything, but what they have heard, but this is probably a tacit understanding that we need to develop a new language. That was also mentioned by some new, with the new vocabularies. And that's my, I don't start again another lecture, but that's one of my mania that we need uh, to describe these contradictions, a new language in social sciences and political analysis. New conceptions need to be um, de developed and, 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 and created. So I stop here, and, and we have a couple of minutes, even if a little, little um, you know, we went uh, further than the, 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 the planned time uh, limit. But I would like to ask you to give us a few words of, of your reflections, maybe just suggestions, especially those who are not going to stay with us and who are leaving mm, Hungary today or tomorrow. Um, Ahmed, of course. Thank you. Okay. Um, I couldn't agree with you more, but I, I have something very simple to say. Um, I think what, what we did, and it was worthwhile, and we all feel it, that we uh, see the burdens of the age, and these burdens we have seen, whether they are uh, concerned the physical environment, or the political environment, or the social environments, environment, uh, they're all man-made. We have brought ourselves to this impasse. And what Sean said earlier uh, this morning was, I think, very important also to um, look and see 
how far we are from um, formulating a normative approach uh, around maybe common values where we can all converge. That's the philosophical part. And that would be very difficult and there has to be a longish process uh, before that could be created. I hope it could be created sometime. Uh, but this, my simple suggestion uh, is that I learned something in, in the, these three days uh, and it's very valuable what I learned. And that is exactly what you said and I'm just going to say it in, in, in uh, uh, different words that we have to develop a common understanding of issues. It is easier than developing uh, norms and normative approaches. Uh, that will take some time. But I think we have seen an example of how that could be done between scientists and social scientists and intellectuals and individualists and, 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 and so on. And I think that's very important. Common understanding, not expect convergence yet, uh, and hope that after that common understanding, convergences could happen. Thank you. Okay, Elon. Um, first, thanks for this very rich, and, and uh, as I said early on, that I came with the realization there was a risk I would learn something, and um, I've in fact, done so, um, and I'm grateful for it. Um, my thought is to maybe to revisit a comment I made yesterday or suggestion with regard to a way of broadening what we think about here. I think the intellectual effort here with a diverse group, and I think it could be more diverse, I mean, uh, the role of, of corporate world, the world of education in, at multiple levels, lots of things. I mean, we can, we can elaborate on that. But I see that as the basis for, for, for developing what a kind of a prototype we want to test. It's the way we create an intellectual framework about what we might do and how we might go at it. And I would like to go back then to what I suggested yesterday, which is a festival. And I'm an experimental scientist in my first career, um, and to some degree have not lost that, um, and therefore think that it's a very difficult thing. And I asked Sean about this earlier this morning. So how do we then take these ideas and try them in a broader public. And the idea of doing a kind of um, festival of, of world change or of, of European change or of whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I'm not really trying to get the right name yet, but simply the suggestion and then actually having a series of events, including play, including improvisation, including dis lectures, discussions, games, whatever, and observing what people from different domains do with that, and learning from it, and iterating that learning to get us to some other step. It doesn't solve all the problems, but I think it it takes us from a very interesting intellectual conversation in a small room to something else. Thank you very much. I couldn't but agree. Jim. Uh, two quick comments. Uh, one, I keep thinking that if you look at what um, I've been especially concerned with two issues in the United States that um, I wonder how they transform them. For example, the issue of gun rights in the United States um, is only developed in the last several decades to the extent that it has been today. What all of us, I think, might 
think about doing is finding out what newspapers we can write for on a regular basis. Three, four articles a year on particular issues that we develop even further expertise than we have on. And it would f start to create, I think, a common culture along the, 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 the sense that we have. I also think, um, <laughs> this is, I was thinking about your, your vision of positive things. The blue sky. Why not have a section that's the cloudy sky? <laughs> In other words, the cloudy or the stormy sky or whatever it is, but use the metaphor, use the metaphor that, you know, that... That's, that's metaphors. No, but blue sky is not enough. Well, we, we, that's what we want is the blue sky, but we, we need to talk about the stormy sky too. I, I'd like to suggest one norm that I think would work um, against at least with war. Uh, war is a big problem today, and uh, even though it doesn't look like, because you can read that you know we live in the most peaceful era of history, but uh, at the same time, all of us are very afraid that we are on the verge of a third world war. So I think it is still. In the we are not here. We discussed this. Several people suggested we are already in a war, but it's very different. It's hybrid, yeah. hybrid war, hybrid which is war, not yes. necessarily identifiable. So I have a very simple rule for war, basically. Um, normally, I mean, today in a global society that we are in, we should have only a single army in the world that is for catastrophes, really, and not national armies. But that would be difficult. You would tell me that's impossible probably to establish uh, one army. And, uh, but I, I suggest just one simple norm, a stop sign, just to use my own you know, example. Any politician that advocates violence against another country or an against uh, a population should be treated as a criminal, whether it's called President Trump or President Putin or whatever, they are criminals, and all of them are criminals. And they should be prosecuted by the world, by, by, by all of us. That's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, I thank you. Who, who, is, who, who, who is next? Well, I, I agree, um, wait, wait. No, 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 wait, wait. I know your, the way how you express things might, um, trigger um, criticism from more realistic people who are or were in politics for good reasons. Um, but if we take off a little bit of the radicalism of your suggestions, it's, it's not necessarily impossible. Civil society could rank politicians. And if you look, if you just read the, uh, the mainstream existing newspapers, Almost every second politician is called by others criminals. I don't, you don't want to give names. In, in Europe, who should be in prison? That's what they suggest. So that's the mutual accusation game. Um, but don't, if, we, if we take back a little bit from this, just blaming and accusing and labeling everyone who's in power a criminal, just um, grading, evalu evaluating. Okay, So that should be just to create a mirror. Um, um, there's an interesting book written by Laszlo um, Barabási, Albert. Um, what is in English, Villanások in Hungarian, Lightning, or I don't know. It's a very interesting book about how interconnected we are and how, how statistical physicists can predict more the future because they, we know more about the past, we have the data, etc. And he gives an example how, um, how individuals, smart individuals and, and civil society can hit back against the surveillance state. There was a story, probably remember, that a guy um, of, of, um, of Middle East origin, who's an American citizen, goes very often to, to the, everywhere in the world. But his name is, 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 is Arabic, which is an indication that he probably has some connections to Islam. And one day, uh, a CIA or an FBI agent is calling him up and very kindly telling him that from now on, you are under our observation. We don't, there's no accusation, but you are, you know, you are on a list. And what he does, um, wherever he goes, I think he does the, 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 the deal with 
arts and local communities wherever in Africa, in our most remote village, he goes to the to the to the toilet, which is in somewhere in the he's sending maybe 20 times a day SMS messages to this CIA or FBI agent to drive him completely crazy, reporting about his um, activities in the toilet and taking picture of, of you know, the, so, the, so in other, it's just, it, it, it sounds funny, but you know, we just, the civil society can hit back with the same tools I said at the very beginning of this conference that we're not using or misusing the technical capacities. This conference was not well advertised, could have been watched by many more people. It's, I think the numbers suggest us that five, six hundred people were following us, but it could have been much more if we are better organized. So there are tools unused or, dis or, or misused by, by us. So I would think in, and what you suggested up until now is, is create a new knowledge base using all the elements of knowledge we already gathered, but in a new structure probably. Um, if nobody else, then I give it back to Jim. question the war powers of the presidency, right? The American Constitution says that war should be declared by the Congress. That has not happened in now close to 80 years, right? And the United States maintains 800 to 1,000 military bases outside of the United States in more, a majority of countries in the world. What for? Let's have this return to democratic sensibilities, and the, the House of Representatives and the Senate can, can make their own decisions on this. Hold people to account and to the Constitution. And that's a very interesting movement. We should pay attention to it and write and talk about it. Yeah, sorry. Um, just to add to this a little bit, or to tweak it, perhaps, my concern is, and we all have lots of evidence of this, um, we can get very quickly into our own echo chambers. And we can write letter, write papers for op-eds and so forth. The question is who's reading it and who's not reading it? Who are we talking to and who do we never get into the conversation at all? And so what I'm, what I'm interested in is thinking about how do we actually change the narratives and the people who address those narratives. How do we actually shake the hell out of this in a way, not by radicalization in a, in a you know, full frontal assault, because I think you end up running straight into the brick wall, but how do we do that in a way that, that actually engages people in the issues that they care about, again, the identities. When we change the conversation with American right-wing evangelicals around environment from the environment to stewardship of God's creation, guess what? A whole bunch of them join up. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So it's, it's about how do we reframe this? And, and that's, again, not to harp on it, but games. And I'm working on a long, large, long base. I mean, it's a three, four-year project to develop a role-playing, empathy-driving, narrative-driven, multiplayer game that really addresses the complexities in a simple way and sustainability. It's another way into the conversation is what I'm trying to get at. Thank you. Um, our younger fellows, or, or, or uh, you can give us your critical comments. As so well. which, who of you are going to help me design the game? I have people at Sony Research Labs in Paris, uh, La Sapienza in Rome, Arizona State University, and uh, a major Hollywood, uh, um, uh, now what do you call it, agent uh, for actors and directors on board now, but it'll take us about 
three to four years to actually write it. I've written a game before in the 90s. Uh, it can be done and it can be powerful. Okay, if there's no comment now, then please Good. send us your comments if we, don't, we can't keep it forever. Um, Janos, you want to say something about our humble, humble um, initiative to formulate a manifesto, or it's too early, let's say? Uh, it's a bit too early, but uh, as Ferry has indicated, and it is a concern, let's say, both uh, uh, scientific, institutional, and also driven by all the concern which was expressed here. Mm. How can we put it together, which is uh, compelling, which is credible, which is doable, which is scientific enough, because after all it's a science institute. How can uh, this uh, many human intellectual <coughs> compassions be translated also for IASC, but not only for IASC, for the whole scientific community into a kind of science agenda. Science agenda which is not for the ivory tower, but uh, which is uh, 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 being driven, being challenged, being implemented in co-design and transdisciplinarily, so not only scientists. And there is a lot of experience in uh, IASC in this area, I'm just referring to the craft program, which is in medium-sized Hungarian cities and landscapes. And uh, it is also, I believe, a very necessary scientific uh, uh, attitude to be modest, uh, uh, to set up objectives which you can deliver on in a foreseeable time. And this is also an enormous challenge because saving the world uh, uh, took Jesus Christ and he died in this process uh, just to, uh, according to one narrative, I don't want to uh, object anyone else, but it means that uh, we have to uh, uh, move in a sustainable way which sustains us and helps the world. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Schusswort. But thank you again. If there is no more. Co thank you very much. Good. Just remember what Dr. Buzek suggests us to be realistic, yeah. but also remember the six days slogan, be realistic, demand the impossible. <laughs> Thank you.